All right, everyone. Welcome to Seabug November edition. Uh, what are we talking about today? Uh, we're going to look at the Sverchok modeling tool. Uh, it's parametric modeling. I'll explain what that is when we get there. Uh, I will show a little bit of subsurface scattering for skin in cycles, which is very fun. And then, I don't know, what do you guys have? Anyone got cool stuff to show? Anyone? No? Yes! <coughs> yeah? Alright, we'll see. We can play it by ear. Uh, I do think we might end up heading out early today, uh, because I can now tell you, it's like 12 weeks, I'm having another baby! So, yay! Uh, so, that means my wife's at home, and she's sick, and she's got to deal with our other kid. So I should probably be helping out, but yeah. I'm learning. I'm talking about Blender instead. So we might head out early. Um, <coughs> and Sverchok, uh, you're gonna have to download it off the internet. Uh, you should tell him how it's spelled. S V. Let's see if we like it first. Yeah. S V E R C H O K. If you look up here, you can see the URL where you can get this. First off, who do we have at Seabug today? My name's Oscar Beckler. I run this thing. I've been doing it for a while. I'm Jay Bancaro. I uh, teach here at, at Lake Washington. I'm Joey. I, uh, I'm a Blender enthusiast, and I do stuff sometimes with things. Hi, uh, I'm Joshua. Um, I guess I do 3D art for a video game. Yeah. Hi, uh, Eric. I'm just interested in playing a job. I'm Matthew. I'm an artist, and I like to use Blender. Uh, they call me Nisqually Polly, Paul Braggett. Um, I'm interested in Blender. I'm slowly learning. David, the uh, sort of ditto, I'm slowly learning. Angelo, I used to work for IBM, but I'm not working now. Cool. What a fine group of people we have. Uh, so, really fast, some stuff that is on the horizon. Uh, because we are part of the open source community, I do want to pitch something, which is Usenix Liza is coming up. Uh, as it was told to me, uh, Usenix was what Linux was before Linux, and this conference is still going on many years later. Uh, but it's going to be November 9th through the 14th, and the expo floor uh, is free, so you can go here and sign up. And I will be at the KDE booth uh, demoing Krita, or Krita, depending on who you ask. Um, which I've shown you guys before. It's a fun drawing program. So if you want to learn some of that, that's a fun thing to go around. And you can also just see all the other open source stuff out there and get a bunch of free coffee mugs and stickers and whatnot. Huh? It's on Windows and Linux, not on Macs yet. But that's theoretically on the way. Huh? Oh, uh, the login is LWIT and LWIT. Yeah, yeah all lowercase. So if you want to go to use Nixliza, you scroll down to. Um, where is it? Sponsors and Expo. Go to Liza 14 Expo. And you can get a free Expo Pass. Anyway, consider it. It'll be fun. I'll be there. We can get coffee. Uh, so, let's get right into Sverchok, which is a parametric modeling tool. What does that even mean? Well, let's look at their demo. 
they recently posted this to Blender Nation, and I think it says everything. So Spare Chalk is very sort of a, an underground Blender add-on. It, uh, it is basically what we've all dreamed about for years, which is node-based modeling, which is what they mean by parametric. Uh, you're setting up uh, components beforehand, and then a model pops out at the end. Uh, and we're going to look at a few examples of that. If you want to play along, you can Google Spare Chalk and find the GitHub page. And you'll want to go over here and download the zip. And then you don't have to unzip it in Blender. You can uh, just navigate uh, in your add-ons panel. You would go to Install from File, navigate to your Downloads folder, or what have you. So here's the Downloads folder. And you would just click on the SverChalkMaster.zip, and it'll install from the zip. So you don't have to unzip. Install. And then you'll see that the add-on is added and you can turn it on. It might take a while to load, so don't click it on and off because then it'll like half load. And save user settings. Another thing that is worth looking at and following along as I show this is a certain blog which is Blender Sushi. blendersushi.blogspot.com and this is a, a user who has done a lot of experiments with Sverchalk and gotten lots of cool things to pop out at the other end. Um, and here's an example of what Sverchalk kind of looks like when you're working on it. Whee! He has a ton of old blog posts talking about Sverchalk from the totally nonsensical to the very cool. He's also done a lot of OSL stuff, so if you want to go under the hood and do some really crunchy Blender stuff, this is uh, a great blog to follow. Oh. <coughs> Alright, so we added the uh, Spare Chalk add-on, and now if we divide our window and switch this to the Node Editor, you'll see that we have a new addition to the nodes, which is right down here. And that is the Sverchok button. Sverchok is Russian for uh, cricket, and the state of this node, or what its future is, is currently uh, kind of uh, undecided. Everyone knows that uh, in the future we want more and more node-based Blender stuff where you can, uh, especially for rigging, that's one of the things I really miss from Maya, is uh, node-based rigging. Um, and uh, node-based objects are another one. And in theory, node-based everything in the future. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting uh, uh, you know, blueprint for what it might look like in the future. Now, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to delete the default cube because Sverchalk is going to output new things for us. So if I click New, we're going to have a node tree added, and nothing is showing up. And the reason is because this is much like if you have your compositor and you have no nodes in it, nothing is going to go in. You have no inputs and you have no outputs. So the first thing we're going to do is examine uh, what our inputs and outputs are in Sverchalk. If you hit Shift-A, or go to the Add menu down here, you get all the nodes that you can add, just like in the compositor. There's generators, analyzers, transforms. 
Lots of interesting nodes, very few of which I understand. The first one we're going to look at, though, is generators. And we're just going to add a box. So we're basically using Sverchok to replace our default cube. And again, nothing happened yet because we need an output. So if I hit add again, we're going to go down to basic viz. And this is kind of like the output panel in the compositor normally. So under basic viz, I'm going to add a draw mk2 node. And this is going to, when we have things connected, uh, fill it in. One flaw of spare chalk right now is in normal compositing, if I selected both of these and I hit F, it would go vert to vert, edge to edge, poly to poly, but instead it just sticks all the starting inputs into the final output. Oh wait. So on this, what we're going to want to do is we're going to take the verts to the vertex panel and the polygon to this attribute, which is edges and polygons. Now something showed up, but not a lot of things showed up. Uh, we have this sort of ghost of a cube, and the reason is because we now can change what the output is <coughs> spitting out. So first off, there's this big button on the view, viewer draw node, which is show it or hide it. And then there's also these buttons, which show or hide the individual components. So we can add the verts, we can add the edges, and we can add the faces, and now it's going to display all of these. We can also make it transparent or not, and shade it flat or smooth. And we can also change the colors. So we can have red lines, white verts, so on and so forth. Now in your tools or in your properties panel in your compositing window, you now have several new options. One is going to be the node options for any given thing that you have selected. But another thing is way down here, you have an update button and an update node tree. So sometimes Sverchok takes a little time to process what's going on. So you might want to hit this one, which is update all, or update node tree to just update one of them. And then we actually have uh, something akin to a layers panel down here. So we have one node tree called basic cube right now. If we now add a new one and add a generator for a cylinder and an output for just to show you a different one, a viewer B mesh. This one is instead going to generate a B mesh. So now we can see, using these layers, which one we want to work on. And also we can change which ones are visible. And uh, <coughs> we can bake it, which is going to take whatever object you created with Sverchok and turn it into a bunch of other things. Uh, so it will be a physical mesh at that point. If you just walked in, we're talking about Sverchok. The things you need to know is, if you look it up, you can find the GitHub page and download the zip. And you can stick that in Blender as an add-on. And then, uh, to find cool things, you can look over here at blendersushi.blogspot.com, which has lots of good recipes that you can try and start duplicating. Anyways, so we have this basic cube and our uh, basic cylinder. And you can see how we can change a lot of these attributes. Uh, and it'll procedurally create this cube. This is uh, something that Blender has lacked for a long time, which is, so let's say we're on layer two. If I added a cylinder in Blender, actually here, where is it? Oh, it's over here. Yeah. If I add a cylinder, when I added this, you can change these attributes. And that's a good way to start off before you go into edit mode. But what's often uh, been said to Blender users, if you then add another object, uh, this cylinder that you created is no longer parametric. All these attributes are now permanent, and it's just a mesh object. So spare chalk is useful in that sense that it almost keeps a state history. So way back in the day, Blender we created this cylinder, and we can still change the attributes. Blender does not actually have a cylinder type object. Yeah, it just creates a mesh, you know. But on creation, you can change these parameters. And then after 
that step has gone, you're never going to be able to do that, even if you undo to that state. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the proposal for the uh, Blender Summer of Code Pyramid primitive was rejected. Huh. So anyways, we got this cylinder, we got this cube. Oh, our cylinder disappeared. No, it's on layer one. All right. Now we can continue to mess with it. <coughs> so let's look at some of these other nodes and try and examine what they do. I'm actually going to turn our cylinder off. Actually, first I'll name it cylinder. And I'll turn off its visibility and I'm going to go back to our basic cube. So generators as a category is your starting meshes. And there's lots and lots of ones you can use. Uh, some of them have uh, features that are kind of wonky. So for instance, Hilbert image uh, lets you use a black and white image um, to make a Hilbert. I don't know. A lot of this is over my head again. I'm still trying to get used to this. And Spare Chalk, unfortunately, right now does not have a lot of documentation other than Blender Sushi's existing recipes. So the best way to learn it is to go into Blender Sushi find you know, screenshots of what he was doing and copy uh, his techniques. The next one that's very important, I would say, is uh, Matrix. Uh, Matrix lets you change certain things about uh, lots of different things. I'll have to go back to my recipes in a bit to see that. Um, Another important one is transform. So if you had a basic object that was not created parametrically, the first thing you would want to do is try to rotate scale it and move it, right? So what you end up having to do is uh, you end up putting the verts. If you had a rotation node, for instance, you'd add a verts into the vertices and you would add that to the output. And then all you have to do is change this angle and it'll rotate. You can also change it to Euler or Quaternion and change the rotation that way. Pretty, pretty wacky, right? Very similarly, just like with other nodes, we can now add a scale node and stick that in between there. Uh, one thing I'm still trying to figure out is uh, uh, how to separate out the scale into X, Y, and Z so you can scale one thing at a time. But you can certainly <coughs> do this. Hey Oscar, are all these nodes, uh, do they transfer into the game engine or do they, are they retained in the game engine? I have no idea. Um, you know, Severe Chalk, again, like, it's so weird and it's so off in its own realm in Blender that uh, the, it's kind of like uh, Freestyle was early on where it was so weird and different that the Blender Foundation wasn't sure how to uh, have it be part of the big picture of Blender. So they largely said, we're not touching it. Um, it's got to get really, really solid before we're going to add it as a default. And, you know, so hopefully in a year or two, it's really good. Uh, supposedly, this is kind of trying to mimic Rhino's. Uh, Rhino, I think, had parametric modeling tools that were really good. Oscar, did yeah? you say that you couldn't figure out how to scale on... Just one axis? I you did? Do Come up. Right. There you go. Have you been playing with this? I yeah. literally just pulled nice. it up. Nice. So, so this is why I wanted to uh, show this off. Cause I know there's a lot of so very good node monkeys. And that round here is going to get really good really fast, I expect. So if we bring in a, uh, oops, wrong one. Bring in a matrix in and then hook this guy up to here. We bring in a vector in. Hook this guy up to the scale. Then we can set these to one. And then you can scale however you want with that. Yeah, and so this is also an example of uh, the order of operations stuff that happens in Blender. You would, uh, I'm still not sure how to set which happens first with the rotation, but I do know that um, a lot of times it changes. So I think I have, 
I'm gonna save this as a second one. So I have a demo file that has some of this set up. So let's look at Another thing that's good to do, by the way, is first thing you can do is check for a new version. And whatever they're doing, I love because it just updates this one plugin. Uh, oh, I lost one of my files. Sorry, guys. So, this is an example of an advanced file. Uh, it starts with a cylinder. And very similar to when you're compositing, you'll have a node out there. It's a viewer node, and it's just so that you can see a single step of your process. Uh, what he's doing here is he's using that for just seeing if he likes his current cylinder. So uh, if I show this, it's just to see that we have this many, and uh, that's where our cubes are theoretically going to go. So it's a cylinder object. The verts just go into a uh, UV connect node, and then a mesh, uh, and then this is going to be the basis for how these other nodes get distributed when we add a cube way later. So this UV connect node then turns into a mesh join node, which then goes into a vector out node, which then uh, has math added. Again, this is a lot of stuff that gets pretty, pretty powerful. And then a vectors in node, uh, which is very similar to when you're setting up, uh, you know, in cycles materials, uh, a lot of the times when you need a coordinate or um, uh, an XYZ or an RGB, you have to manually add where those are and then stick it in. You do the same thing in Spare Chalk a lot. So uh, this says it goes up on the Z, or it rotates on the Z axis by one times this amount of angle, which is based off of way over here, the cylinder's amount of vertices somehow. Then we just add a box. So I think an earlier version of this that I played with had just the mesh join going into the matrix. And the matrix sort of uses this to no, that was not one. See, I don't even know, man. This stuff is so complex. Uh-oh, I hit the Windows Store button. So if you guys want to follow along, I'm going to try and show off some of these spare chalk recipes that they have on Blender Sushi. So I'm going to start with the default file. I'm going to make sure that my spare chalk plugin is loaded. Spare chalk is loaded. I'm going to delete the default cube, go to spare chalk, and hit new. So let's try making his recipe for a chair. I'm going to start with the objects in and objects out so I can more quickly see uh, what comes out. So I start with a cylinder and let's see, a basic visualizer of a viewer draw. And polygons to edge polygons. 
and vert to vert. And then I'll turn on visibility for these things. We only want four verts on this because we're making a table. Then we're going to add a uh, matrix apply node. And what this does is I think it's kind of like a flattener node. But then we need a matrix in to tell it what to use as that. And we're basically, uh, this is sort of the complex way that you have to do translation. So rotation, <laughs> we saw, is just a really simple node uh, where you add a, a node and you can say Euler 90 degree. Uh, translation is a little harder. So we have to have a vectors in that then goes into a matrix in for the location. And now this will let us do translation. So I can use this to translate my node. Make sense? I'm gonna I'm gonna add a number, which is a float, uh, and this is going to affect both my radius top and radius bottom. And then we can have one node that controls both. We'll set it to 9, and that'll make it nice and big. If you wanted a table that's a little funkier, you could say a math node that affects just the top, and say multiply. So now we can have a little bit of an offset to our table, but for the most part, they're going to stay connected. All right, so that's our table top, right? So far it makes sense. Mm -hmm. The cylinder with some weird stuff that we change around. Next up, we're going to add a separate bake node that's going to be the, the chair legs. So I duplicated the viewer draw node, and then we need another cylinder Let's duplicate this cylinder. With verts going to verts, polygons to po uh, edge polys. And this one I'm going to set at... Uh, he ends up using a bunch of different floats to set these outside of this. So we're going to have a float at 0.7. Float at 2 and the float at 8. I actually set this to 4 because this one is going to affect the number of verts in our cylinder. So you can kind of see it here. Here, I'll turn off the other one so we can just look at the chair leg. So I want this to be a square chair leg, but if you wanted to have more verts or less verts, you would just increase this node now. This is going to be the radius bottom. This one's going to be the radius top. And lastly, we're going to add a node for the height, which will go into height. And this one is going to be you know, pretty high up. So we know right now that at some point, one change we're going to do with our nodes is somehow we're going to want to move these table legs down, and then we're going to want to uh, make a matrix that splits them into four and moves them around the chair. So next up we need to uh, create the object that is going to give us those points of the four chair legs. And that is going to be using a circle. Uh, so what we end up doing is a circle with four chair legs. So I can just type in 4, or you can add another float, set it to 4, and plug it into there. That's 
Yeah. So this way, you know, the, the radius and the position of your legs is kind of independent of the table top. Yeah. But, but if you use the cylinder that was the top, then you could like... Yeah, and this is where um, using separate float nodes is good. Is let's say you want uh, the chair. Uh, I think at one point uh, it is in this recipe. Uh, a single float is used for both the size of the upper cylinder and the size of the circle that distributes the chair legs. So by changing one float, the table uh, stays synonymous. And then you could have like a math node that adds a little bit of radius to the uh, the tabletop, and so that way it always extends a little further. But you could just change that math node to uh, change how much it moves off that. Oscar? Yeah? Mm, to find radius for a square. Uh, uh, it's, not a r it's not a square, it's a cylinder with only four polygons. Just gonna be oh, yeah. Radius. Yeah, um, so the radius is basically the size of it. Um, Since so you can increase the number, it's actually sure. a cylinder. I'm going to create, right. I'm going to create a separate viewer node so we can just look at uh, our upcoming matrix. So verts to verts. And now you can see the radius, right? So it's the radius of the, the vector points from from the center to a vert. Yeah. So if we set this to four, you can see that it is four blender units. So that's our radius okay. with a circle, a quote unquote circle that because it only has four uh, four edges, it ends up being a square. So this is an example of how this mimics the compositing workflow where we're using a viewer. This is not going to be one of the objects that we fi use in the final version, but we have this as a viewer node to see our progress as we go. All right, so next up, uh, we are going to... Uh, hmm. We're going to set this to a matrix in node, which is going to try and create some sort of matrix out of the data in our cube. Or not our cube, our, our circle. All right. So we have a, we're also going to add a vector move. So I think first off, we're moving this up or down. And this is how we move those chair legs down. So we're going to add a vector move here. You can see that now it's disappeared. This is going to go into our matrix in location. And we're also going to add a vectors in for the rotation. Okay, because all of these are connected to the original cylinder um, or part of the original cylinder's node setup, is it calculating locally from the center of the cylinder, the cylinder's origin point, or is it... Uh, I think so, and it's one of those things where um, the order of operations of how these nodes function is still kind of wonky to me. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, you would think that it goes left to right, but what happens is if you have a, if you're using the vector in node to, um, or if you're using a vector move node followed by a matrix in node to change how these are located. Oops, did something bad. Um, eventually what happens is instead of going left to right, it actually uh, does the rotation node and then transforms it on the local space. So, you know, instead you rotate 45 degrees and then your translation does not happen in Z up down, it happens in Z local. Oh. Um, yeah. All right. Now we're getting into the territory of stuff I do not fully understand, but I'm just following the recipe. We're learning in real time here. We're going to add a matrix to form, which uh, is going to be targeted by our matrix in and go into another matrix to form. And our circle.
circle, goes into a vector move, and then a vector in, which affects the rotation here. Oh, and we're also going to use our verts from our original circle to adjust the angle here. We're just taking this on faith right now. I'm going to duplicate this float node. We get a bunch of floats over here. And this one goes into the matrix deforms angle. And call it 180. And then we need another vectors in node set to 0, 1, 0. The nice thing about these recipes is even when you don't understand them, which, I mean, this is, this is really cutting edge stuff, so I don't understand it. Um, eventually, once all these nodes are connected, using this uh, Blender Sushi Guy's recipes, you can then go back and start changing the values on these nodes, and then it all starts to click. Like, you'll be able to see, like, why certain things worked the way they did. Ah, so now we have all this and this final matrix to form is actually going to go in as the matrix for this, which will now show. Is that working? Doesn't look like it. Cylinder, matrix deform, matrix deform, So somewhere around here, there's supposed to be a float that changes, that affects this vector. There we are. Look at that. Hooray! Take that demo effect. So now if we turn our table on, we can start seeing the problems that we need to fix. And, I don't know. Try screwing with it. So this node, which is affecting the table side, uh, we might want this to also plug into um, the size of our circle that's determining our radius for the t chair legs. And now I'm sort of riffing. I'm not on the full thing. I'm going to duplicate the math node, set it here. So it's always multiplying by 0.8. So from a top view, you can see that the chair legs are always going to be slightly smaller than that. Alright. So one of these. Let me That's not it. Nope. One of these hopefully changes. Nope, that's a rotation. Also rotation. So that's how he rotates them. The matrix ends up going into uh, this node. So again, we have our chair node as a viewer, and we have this one. And the matrix basically is like, it's almost like a dupliverts or duplifaces part of uh, this. Somewhere in here we changed the size. There is a vector in. Nope. Ah, it was this vector's move attribute. There we go. So 
So the vector move attribute is where we placed our chair originally. Now I can go like that, and now I can manually place where it is. All right. So now if I wanted a mesh version of this, I could hit B and bake it. And in theory, I create an object that has this stuff. I don't know. Did not bake. No. Oh. Cool, man. See, a lot of this stuff is, you know, pretty beyond me, but you can already see some of the power of this. For instance, uh, using one float to control multiple attributes. Uh, you could do that also to change, like, if you wanted the table and the chair legs to always have mimicking uh, amounts of uh, how wider they are on top, you could do that. Question? Yeah. Can you Name those nodes. Can you give one called width of tape, you know, just call I think so. Oh yeah, press, uh, go into the end panel. Yeah. And, uh, um, here this node is called circle. Uh, label, you want to go into label underneath it. Label and then enter. And this would be, uh, let me see. So this one, I believe this circle is the, um, what we end up using for the matrix array of, Well, um, pick one that has a logical Alright, so like this one, we could say chair leg. And this one, which we know as the chair leg distributor. Number of legs. Yeah, we could say this is num legs. So, so somebody could make a model and they could label all the nodes. So yeah. It would be really yeah. Um, oh, that's another thing that would be a nice thing to control with a single attribute is we can have a node here. I'll call this float uh, uh, divisions. And this single node we'll put into both the uh, verts of the chair top and the verts of our num legs. So actually I'll delete this one. So now with a single attribute we can say, you know, we want a table that's divided five times. This is really cool, right? Does it go berserk if you try to put in a decimal? No, it, I mean it's a it's a float values and it's just rounding it down. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, this is another reason why this is really great. You can imagine some of this stuff being uh, accomplishable by using arrays and stuff. Um, but also, all these nodes are keyframeable. So we can go like that. And so far. And we can watch our chair. Woo! <laughs> Again, this is really still very alpha software um, you know it's not in the blender by def it's not in blender's add-ons by default but it's still very very cool already you think it's going to make it into the default i think eventually it's going to be in there by default um, i know i ta i asked ton about this at sigraph and um, he said he, he mostly didn't understand it but he knows that you know blender users really really want node based everything in the future and this is at least a way to get there. I think the main things it still needs to work on is first off documentation. Uh, you know, uh, I think I have in this file. Let's check my text editor. Nope, that got lost. Oh wait, it wasn't this one. I'm gonna save this as spare chalk chair. So as a list of documentation regarding. Uh, just what all these nodes do. This little panel where I've started writing stuff out is as far as I can tell the best documentation <laughs> out there. Uh, which is very pathetic. Um, I'm sure the documentation is out there somewhere in Russian. 
Yeah, that's another part of it. And you know, hooray for Google, a lot of these things just instantly translate. Um, At least it's not Japanese because, uh, uh, well, if Japanese, Google Translate does not work well with. Sort of like if you go to a Japanese page, you're like, I can't even get the intent from this. Huh. Like, something blender. Okay, I'm going to insert a keyframe on this. And then I'm going to go into my animation panel. Keyframes on my nodes. Maybe it's on the driver. I don't know if you're able to see them. I think you can do it on compositing stuff. Somewhere there's a way to do this stuff. Okay. So you can't necessarily instantly see these, but what we could do. Sorry, I'm just riffing now. I'm gonna instead add a driver to this. If I can. Can I add driver? Add driver. And under in our animation panel, now we'll go to driver. Oh, I can't see the driver. Well, anyways, a lot of people are doing cool stuff where they animate this stuff. And so the part of your demo that, that so you could convert this into an ordinary blender mesh and you all have yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, one of the easier ways to do it is so supposedly there's a bake button and that will create one, but I have not been able to find it after that. So now if I turn off visibility on this, I never got my bake tunnel. However, what we can do is Instead of using these output nodes, uh, I can use a uh, BMesh output. So basic viz, viewer BMesh, and then verts to verts, edges to edges, polygons to polygons, and matrix to matrix. Then I'll delete this old viewer node. And this. These are all objects now that I can move around. And the thing is, they're currently controlled by Sverchak. Um, but I think on this one, if I hit bake, it's around. Or the other thing is, if I just delete this, now all these are... I don't know. I could du duplicate them and join them. And there we are. Now they're no longer Sverchak. I think. Yeah. So these are no longer spare chart. Uh One last thing I do want to show you because uh, you probably have existing files that you prefer. Uh, let's go back to my spare chart chair. It's cool. Uh, let's deactivate this visibility and create a new mesh object. 
a monkey, if you will. You can create a node tree that uses these. So for instance, we can use the uh, analyzers. It's somewhere. There's a get and set node. So you can use this to like load it with a mesh. Yeah, basic data object in. And what we can do is add this to a basic viz of a viewer draw. I'm going to move this monkey to layer 2. And then I'm going to hit get while having this monkey selected. So now with that monkey selected, Hello. we can we can use that as a spare chalk input. So now our basic mesh data that's out there somewhere in our blend file is also affecting spare chalk uh, over here. I'm going to try and show the basic easiest matrix and probably mess up doing it. Um, I'm going to use matrix in. Right. I'm going to use a analyzer to get the centers of polygons from this monkey. And use the origins as a set, or I'm going to use the centers as the matrix out. So in theory, this is uh, getting the centers of each individual polygon. And now I'm using this to say it's, it's an array of data that's you know one per face of that. So now, if I add a generator for a box, and then a viewer node, the box is going to be the thing that we're looking at. So edges and polygons. I'm going to make it really small. And then we can use this matrix out as, or maybe it's just the centers. And there we go. We have cubes for every face. Pretty cool stuff, right? Cool. All right, we're, at the, we're almost at the hour mark. Does anyone else have? Spare chalk questions that I'm not going to be able to answer. Uh, I, I sincerely hope that you guys play with this more. I'm going to play with it more. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff being done with it. And uh, one of the things that we saw in the video, um, um, there's a lot of things you can do architecturally with this. So at some point, here they are using a CNC machine to use uh, to lay that individual chunks of a table and then you get this really beautiful furniture design um, and you just know it's going to fit together by a spare chalk. I could see this saving me a lot of grief when I want to make a flower that has five-fold symmetry. Yeah. It's a it's 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 like anything that's more complex in Blender. It's gonna at first cause you lots and lots and lots of grief, but eventually when you understand it, it's gonna be awesome. How do you install it again? To go over the install one last time. First off, you're gonna go and search Sverchak Blender, and the first thing that comes up is this guy's well, second thing is this guy's GitHub. You go there, and you're going to download the zip file. Blender can install add-ons from a zip file. So next, you go to Blender. And under Add-ons, you're going to Install from File, navigate to where that file is. So here I'm in my Downloads folder. And there you, get, you can see the various Sverchak builds. And then you install from File. and. It's in there somewhere. And there's Spare Chalk. You turn it on. Which file did you, did 
do you download the Wisconsin? Just download the zip, the and then zip. the zip is what you load in. You don't have to unzip it and find and like stick it in a directory. Okay. It's a lot. It's a very good system. I uh, I don't know when they started doing that, but I like it. Okay. Installing from zip is the way to go. And again, one thing you should do is because Sverchok is updating so frequently, first thing you do when you update is check for new versions, and uh, you'll get a very up-to-date build. Thank you. Oh yeah, before, I want to just take you through some of this guy's other recipes. So like, you can just look at his website and see lots of the coolest things he's doing. <coughs> and you can also input a lot of uh, Cody crunchy stuff, if you want. This guy's website is also really good for uh, OSL shading programming, which we have yet to have an expert on here at CPUG, but someday we will. We do have an expert, though. Joe is our expert. CPUG expert. Does expert here mean I don't want? To? Yes. Okay. Yes, it does. does have Maya equivalents. I'm trying to see where the Rhino one he talked about is. Cool stuff. Oh, let's do this procedural city, man. The Severchak procedural city is really cool. So a lot of play time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I need to have these predefined and then bring them into Seabug and just look cool when I show you. Well, that's so how you made them. Yeah. So like he creates a mesh that just has some crappy grease pencil strokes on it. Turns that into a spare chalk division, which then starts making cities, which then greebles out more and more. Um, and it's really just like a different way of thinking. So it's very cool. Okay, let's take a break, and then when we get back, we'll do something else. And now I'm going to pause the recording.